All righty, we'll get started. Um, first off, thank you everyone for, for joining us. The reconvention of our Dream Street Lending Coaches Seminars. Um, Justin Shaw, assistant uh, with Melbourne United. We've got Dean Vickerman on the line and tonight's uh, special guest is going to be Nick Popovich, our high performance manager, um, and he'll take you through some various things. Uh, just some housekeeping. So you would have seen in the, the chat any questions, please throw them in there as we go along. There will be a question time at the end uh, that we that we'll make sure that we, we hit everything that comes through. Um, and then outside of that, just making sure that things are muted so that we're not getting some uh, background noise as we go. Uh, as well as Dream Street Lending, we do need to thank our other sponsors, Tire Power, Soda Stream, Buller, Trojan Tools, Rolled, Harcourts, Subaru, Moose Toys, TAC, Chemist Warehouse, Wiz and the Sporting Globe. Um, back in lockdown, hope everyone's staying safe and sound. And we thought that uh, our best way to get this back up and running was to talk about what basketball looks like in your home right now and how you can prep for it. But before we get to that, we thought we'd let uh, Dean talk about our world in lockdown and, and where we're at from a Melbourne United point of view. Over to you, Dana. Thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, you know, for us, we've been you know extremely fortunate that um, elite sport has allowed us uh, to practice three days a week at the moment at MSAC. Um, we're kind of the only tenants in there at the moment. Uh, we did have a couple of the netball teams training as well, but they've moved up into their to their hub in Queensland, and so. Um, We've tried to certainly lock it down to, um, you know, 15 or uh, 16 people uh, coming to our practices and making sure that they um, don't go to other practices as well to either the Boomers or Southeast so that we can try and contain uh, the spread a little bit. But those guys, we continue to talk about how privileged they are, you know, to come into the facility and get to enjoy practicing basketball and, uh, and trying to get better and spending time, um, just like every one of you wish that you could do right now. So it's a it's a privilege that we have, and uh, we're not wasting it. We're we're certainly um, you know going at it pretty hard. So three sessions a week. Wednesday today was a um, a scrimmage day where we put players in three teams and give them some some basic concepts and just let them play and ha have a fun day. Uh, Monday and Friday have been. A, a real mix of, of skills and, and breakdowns, um, but certainly some fun components as well. We're still playing our Friday soccer and um, you know getting a lot of shots up as well. Putting our team roster together, um, you know we feel like we've added a lot of youth this year, and then you know got some great veterans, you know coming back and re-signing Dave Barlow and and Chris Golding as well. But you know Jack White and others to be announced. And, and then our Asian player in, uh, in Udai, um, you know, he's, he's gonna join us as soon as he possibly can. And then we still have import spots to fill and one roster spot uh, remaining in our 10, where we've gone down to a, a two import model from previous years where we've had three imports. So that's where we sit at the moment. Um, currently, Pop is up in Sydney and doing great work remotely at the moment, like a lot of you guys are doing in your own workspace and, and looking forward to his presentation tonight. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Justin. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's well and, and doing the best they possibly can with uh, the restrictions that uh, have been placed on everyone, especially in Victoria. Um, understand what you're feeling and obviously I would love to be back in Victoria, but for now, got to wait until we can uh, get that sorted out. Uh, just wanted to go through some things tonight. Um, obviously, a lot of you out there, you know, might be thinking, well, you know, this will be shut down for a while and, and I need to, you know, do something so I'm prepared to get back onto the court. And, and I think that's the most important thing you've got to look at is, is how you prepare yourself. You expose your body to the right loads, uh, a progressive um, direction through that uh, training so that you get back to the court when you do and, and uh, you're best prepared as, as much as you can. Um, what I'm going to do tonight, guys, is I'm going to base this uh, presentation on, on all of you having absolutely zero equipment. And uh, 
I think that's the best way to approach it because I think if I, if I try to sort of uh, make a lot of things, a lot of programs, sorry, um, based on, oh, you, you might have these pieces of equipment or you might have a few dumbbells or you might have some bands, we'd be here for hours. So uh, basing it on no equipment is, is the easiest way I think we can do that. And um, from that, you get to understand your body a lot better. I mean, in my experience, um, the, the muscles really don't know a difference between a load, whether it's, you know, a barbell or a dumbbell or a band or just your body weight. So there's various ways we'll, we'll talk about how you can mani manipulate those loads and how you can make it more difficult and challenging for you. But before we even get to that, and I must say this, what I present to you guys today isn't a specific program for a particular athlete. It's, it's a roadmap. It's gonna give you some ideas of how to prepare your week, how you prepare your day, and, and what you need to do over a course of time to get to a stage where you really wanna uh, be ready for, for back, back to court practice. But before we do that, I thought I'd start, and I hope technology serves me well here, I thought I'd start with some, with some fun. Um, let's see if this works, okay. So this is, a, this is a group I worked with a few years ago and uh, my experience with no, uh, no equipment has been very vast. You know, sometimes you get the chance to work out in gyms as you can see in the background there in this particular picture and sometimes you don't. I've, I've, I've had workouts in, in hallways of, of uh, hotels and, and anything you can do to keep the athletes going I think is a, is, is a, is a key point. So I'll just play this short video for you. It only runs for about 20 seconds and just some of our guys that I worked with a few years ago. Okay, so you, you get the general gist um, in showing everyone that we're going to make sure that uh, safety is number one, all right? No injuries when you're doing any type of training. You've got to make sure you're safe. And uh, with that, we'll go into that uh, slide. If Justin, you could uh, open up that first file for us and we'll start looking at what we, uh, what we need to do. Okay, great. So. My plan tonight, guys and girls, is to really break everything down and have a look at um, what are the physical areas you need to, to sort of work on to be physically better at performing the skills that you perform on the court. Now, you know, if you have a look at the screen there, everyone, everyone can read and you can sort of read through. I'm not going to bore you to tears with, with going through every single bit and piece, but I do want you to focus on, on, on a couple of things. The first and foremost thing is, what are the physi physiological requirements that you need to execute the actions that you want on the court? So if you look in the red there on the left-hand side, you've got strength, you've got power, you've got speed, agility, conditioning, and some mobility and flexibility. Now, we could list a few others as well, but for my money and for my experience, these are the crucial areas that you need to develop within your, within your bodies, within your physicality, um, that you will find will help you execute those skills better. So if we break it down, we look at strength, we've got lower upper, we've got some rotational stuff, we've got some integrity in joints. And what I mean by that is, are your ankles good? Can they land? You know, can your knees absorb landing? Can your hips absorb landing? Um, when you move through to power, you know, some vertical and horizontal power and takeoff power, your upper body power as well, some horizontal plane power there. Speed, are you quick in a straight line? Are you quick laterally? Are you quick in all directions? Agility, can you move and change direction and move quickly to another direction? Um, your conditioning is an obvious one. Can you last the practice? Can you get up and down the court? you're always gonna have a mix of both energy systems, so your aerobic and your anaerobic energy systems whenever you're on the court. Obviously, sometimes there's certain drills or certain ways that your practice might tap into 
uh, more of the aerobic system than the anaerobic system, but there always is going to be a mix. And then flexibility to finish that off is basically, are your joints mobile enough, and not too mobile, but are they mobile enough to help you execute certain movement patterns? Okay, so if you have a look at that, that's our first one on the, on the, on the left-hand side in the red. They're the basic fundamental physiological requirements that you need. Now, if we move through on the right side, these are the ones that I think make the difference in your physical acceleration, if you will, in terms of development, how, how much you can improve. Can you decelerate? Can you stop on a dime? Can you stop when you're going forward or laterally or diagonally? Landing's a big one. I know our medical team, our physiotherapists and myself have really worked hard this past year on working on how guys land. If you think back to when we were kids, we kind of just get out and play and run and jump and, you know, no one teaches us how, teach us, teaches us how to run or jump or land. So obviously in basketball, you've got to jump. Do you land two footed? Do you land one foot? Sometimes it's out of your control. What happens when you land? Can you stabilize? Can you take off again? Uh, moving forward, the change of direction. We talked about that with a little bit of, uh, with agility, but I think even more so with change of direction, uh, your abilities to go in one plane of motion and, uh, and absolutely change at a different speed to go in another plane of motion. When we look at basketball, you see a lot of those movement patterns follow that sort of patterning. You're going one way, then you make a hard cut, you go another way, you might set a screen, then you make another cut. So that change of direction is a real crucial one. And the last one right there in the orange, and I'm not going to speak too much about it because it's not my area of expertise, but to sort of share with you some personal stuff, I, I, am, I do have celiac disease, which means I, I can't eat anything with wheat or gluten, um, barley, oats, a lot of those type of things. So for me, at, at the tender age of 40, I, I was diagnosed with celiac disease and I found out that, wow, I've got to change my, my nutritional patterns and, and what I eat and how I eat. So what I've got there, as you'll see and, and can read, is do you eat to live or do you live to eat? And as a professional or a semi-professional or even an amateur athlete that is aspiring to climb the scale, um, I think, I believe, I strongly believe that food and nutrition is a key area. So that's the first page. Now we're going to break that further down, going on to the next page. Right, now, as you guys can see, what I've tried to do there is list as many exercises as I could fit on that page that do not require one piece of equipment with the exception of your body weight. Now, if we break it down in categories, if we look at the first one, and this one is strength, we're talking about strength being anywhere between one and five reps and six to 12 reps. Now, without getting too technical about it, absolute strength between one and five reps is something that when we are approaching that area where we're really focusing on maximal strength gain. So if you're in a, you're in a weight room and you're doing a squat and you're working on four reps or three reps, you're really trying to maximize the absolute strength that you have. And typically, you know, these numbers sometimes overlap, but typically anywhere between six and 12 reps, we're talking about trying to build muscle size. So if you remember back, I said, muscles don't really understand, or sorry, muscles don't know the difference between loads. How you will do a body weight movement when you're in isolation, when you're in lockdown, that will force you to max out at five reps is challenging. You might be able to do five push-ups quite easily. So you need to manipulate certain things to be able to do that to get the desired effect. And I've also put there a bit of a guideline on how long you should rest when you're aiming for these different variables. So if it's you know, one to five reps, you're resting 120 seconds. If it's six to 12 reps, you're resting 60 seconds. And you'll see that further on. I won't go through any exercise, uh, sorry, any of the exercises specifically, but well, what I've tried to do is put six lower body and six upper body exercises that you can do. Now, if you have any questions, 
and you're not sure of some of the exercises, uh, definitely put it on the chat. We can go through it, through it in the uh, question time. Or I do have my email address there on the, uh, the document up there. You're, you're free to, feel free to email me. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions there. Or you could Google them. Most of them would be self, you know, sort of easily uh, found on, on the internet and uh, you can sort of go from there. Any one of those options. Now we move to power, okay? Now we're talking about one to five reps. So you might look at that and you say, well, what's the story there? You had one to five reps for strength and now you've got one to five reps for power. How does that work? So when we're talking power, we're talking about speed of execution. We're talking explosive movement and we don't want to do any more than five reps typically because you're going to run out of gas. You're going to run out of gas. You're not going to be able to do the same exercise with good form. Typically, it's not always, but typically. And we're talking a whole different area of movement velocity or speed, if you will. So you can see there, there's a lot of uh, explosive type movements in the lower body with your skipping and your bounding and your box jumps and so on. And then the upper body ones, definitely some, so I put down four that you can do at home. And I put down either medicine ball or, or basketball. Now, if you have a medicine ball, great. If you don't, no problem. If you have a basketball, just as good. The load will be different, but you know, after you do a certain few sets and, uh, of certain uh, of some of those exercises, you'll definitely feel it. So that that type of work there needs a good base of strength to work from. Okay, that's why the strength's important, and it's part of the whole equation of how you build a more stronger, robust, powerful body. Okay, and again, I've got the rest periods there, anywhere between two to five minutes. If you're working on something that's light in, in intensity, like skipping, you rest about two minutes or so. If you're working something that's really uh, explosive, like a tuck jump or a split jump, you're trying to rest five minutes. Now, the question I, I normally get with that is, well, if I'm resting five minutes, isn't that too long? You know, my, my workout's going to take forever to finish. Uh, not necessarily. You're only going to be doing a small amount of these exercises per session. And what we're trying to do here is replenish the nervous system. Power, if you think of your nervous system like a, uh, a train station and, and, a, and a sort of series of, of train stops, that message from your brain runs down that train station in your nervous system. And the quicker we can run down that, that uh, line of train stations, the better the muscles will fire up. If you're not, gi not giving that nervous system enough rest, you won't get the desired uh, result, which is explosive power at your absolute maximum. So that's, that's an important key to remember. Now, if we move across to the right, we have, let's move everything out of the way, we have speed. It's a real important one, okay? Have a look there, I put up something that's called work rest recovery ratio, okay? So basically, if I'm working for one second, I'm resting for eight seconds. Now, you can work some speed drills at a uh, lower level of, of, uh, of a work rest recovery ratio, but typically you're not gonna be working uh, pure speed and quickness, you're gonna be working what's called speed endurance. So can you sort of hold a certain uh, quickness in the drill and can you sort of do repetition after repetition? And then you're starting to, to engage different energy systems in your body. But if we're talking pure speed, um, a one to eight work rest recovery ratio is what you're looking for. And I've given you some examples there, both linear, lateral and multi-directional or rotational. And you know, something from five, 10, 20 meter sprints, um, either forward or backward. And, and, and you think about it, guys and girls, you don't necessarily, no one really practices running backward, but some of the times you find yourself uh, on the court and you might have to take three or four strides backwards before you get a chance to rotate and then sprint forward. So it's just as important to practice that backward direction as it is the forward one. The lateral one's an obvious one. You've got to be able to slide. Um, I've put those di distances there because of the difference differences in dimensions in court uh, space, spacing with that free throw line. 
um, you know, drills where you go from outside the free throw line to outside the free throw line. There's variations. Uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about distances when you're training at home um, with the exact distance. As long as you get roughly around that, say, four meter mark, you know that that's close to what a free throw line is. Um, some diagonal work and some defensive slide work, which is obviously important when you're working on lateral speed and then your multi-directional um, type of movements, a defensive slide closeout, some forward sprints with a turn and then back, and then some backward sprints with a turn and forward. Now, I have to say, when you're at home and, and you're working on particularly speed, agility, and conditioning, obviously, yeah, most of us won't have access to a court uh, during this time and period with, with lockdown. So you've got to try and pick a surface that you can run on that's not going to impact your knees and your hips and your ankles too too much like running on concrete that that would be sort of you know detrimental to what you're trying to do but again if you run on something soft grass sort of surface it might be too slippery especially if there's been a bit of rain so from a safety point of view uh if i'm advising you guys to sort of do some speed work i'd be looking at if you can get to a a track a running track hopefully most of those tracks are still accessible as part of the restrictions and, and what you need to do to, to exercise. That would sort of give you both the best of both worlds, the grip, but also a little bit of rebound effect that, that doesn't affect uh, your joints as, as much. Now, if you can't get to a track, try to find something that's, that's firm uh, in terms of a surface that's firm, not too slippery, and you can get good traction on might be uh, you know a tartan track or it might be a, a park down near where you live and you have a pretty sort of shortcut grass level area that isn't too uh, slippery so that's the speed covered when we move that to agility for the next sort of category you will see that the work rest recovery ratio is different slightly less one to four to six so we're saying if i work for one second i'm taking four to six seconds rest now a little bit more of a conditioning component here because you're not getting as much uh, recovery but at the same time you're trying to work specific movements and movement patterns as well as energy requirements that you would on the court on the court you might be running up for a rebound stop turn slide back to oh, we've got the ball back, run forward again. So that type of multi-directional work um, is, is, has a, a lower recovery rate to it. And you can see there the exercise that I've put, T drill, star drill, figure eight drill, a cross drill, and we'll go through some of those. If any of you can get to a hoop, you can set up some cones, you can sprint off the baseline, you can curl and cut. If you have a, someone to help you, or even if you have the ball that you pick the ball up and shoot. So, any type of cone formation you can create where you're watching a game, you're thinking, I've got to work on this particular movement pattern that I know my position requires, whether you're a, a guard or, or, a, or a wing player or, or even a big player, a post player, you can work on that type of movement pattern specific to your position. As we move forward, conditioning has an even less work rest recovery ratio okay we've got a one to a 3.6 work rest recovery ratio so if we round it up to four or we take it down to three um, that's still okay it doesn't have to be exactly on the 3.6 but i've given you some examples there uh, of 20 40 meter shuttles that if i it took me five seconds to run 20 meters i'm resting for 18 seconds now this type of work and the same with the 40 meter there, if I run 70, uh, sorry, seven seconds, and I have a 25 second work rest recovery ratio. If I'm doing blocks and sets of maybe 10 of these, you'll definitely feel the anaerobic energy system firing up and really getting um, uh, worked hard. You'll, you'll feel that, that sort of lactate build up, your mouth becomes dry, breathing becomes dry, and that mimics a lot of the uh, energy systems you need during a, during a game. Then there's something there that I put down uh, that uh, a couple of the guys did. I know one of our guys that visited uh, practice who's currently in the NBA had to do it for his program, a three minute full court run, and uh, had to get certain amount of uh, repetitions of the full court sprint in three minutes. So that could be something that you could set up with a court being 28 meters in length 
you could try that as well. And the last thing on that page, we have mobility and flexibility. The most important that I found in basketball athletes is your thoracic or your mid spine, your shoulder mobility, your hip, knee, and ankle. These are the areas that will take most of the load when you're doing those movement patterns. Okay, so let's move across now, move down, I should say. Okay. Now we've talked about the fundamental physiological uh, requirements. These are the ones that I think really make a difference. Once you've got those others down pat and um, you're starting to work on some of these areas, this is something that really can sort of elevate your physicality, if you will. Okay, the first one at the top there, deceleration. Now I've put in brackets, eccentric loading. I'm sure most of you would have heard that term, but for those who haven't, eccentric loading is just basically your muscles gaining tension while they're lengthening. So for example, as in a stop or a landing like I've got there. And our ability to stop or land and then recoil and sprint or jump again is crucial. Think of a rebound. You miss the first one, you get off the ground, back up as quick as you can. You get the, you miss the second one, you bounce back off the ground, you get the third one. Something like that it happens a lot in the game. And, uh, you know, your ability to perform those physical activities will depend specifically on your difference makers, on your ability to decelerate and land. So if you have a look there for deceleration, five metre forward sprint and stop and alternate your leg. So you've got your cones, you set them up, you sprint as hard as you can, try and stop on your left leg. You take that recovery that's, that's set up for that, that specific drill, walk it back, you do the same thing, you alternate, you stop on your right leg, okay? Same thing can be done with a diagonal cut. You know, we're not always gonna be sprinting forward, we're definitely gonna diagonally cut a lot, of a lot of the times. And again, the same thing can be done there as well with a slide. Can you slide explosively and then stop on the one leg without falling over, without you know, uh, leaning over, holding your st stability and, and making sure that everything's in line and then practicing both sides. Your landing, like I mentioned before, is a big one. If you have a look at injuries, typically injuries, not always, not always, but typically injuries happen when you land. It might be obviously you might land on someone else's foot, you roll your ankle, Okay, that's, that's a different thing. But I know with, with some of the research I've looked into and some of the athletes I've worked in with, sorry, um, the ACL injury is a big one in basketball and a lot of sports, and that typically ha happens on a land and rotate of the lower leg. So how good you are landing on double leg, on single leg, um, how good you are not only landing in a forward motion, but from a lateral motion, from a diagonal motion. Those different things will make a big, big uh, difference to, to your abilities. And as you can read there, I've got different variations, double leg landings, single leg, single leg landings, from two foot, from one foot, um, lateral versions as well. The thing I will say, it's very, very important that you get down pat the two leg and you can start building into some one leg as you, as you progress through. But obviously one leg's a lot harder. So you know, normally we have differences between our right and left legs. So if you know, for example, your left leg is weaker, you can start to build some, some landing drills in. But again, it's crucial, and as you will notice, 15 centimeters isn't that high. You don't need a very, very high platform to come off on because obviously the higher it is, the harder it is, and the more load that is on your joints. So what we're talking about here is progressing that load slowly. Start low, be patient, and you will definitely get better. And then we move through to change of direction. Now we're talking about our ability to absolutely change direction and explode and push from the ground using the ground as a, as a reaction force to, uh, to expel, if you will, to, to push us in another direction. And I've just put down there lateral bounds and diagonal bounding lateral bounds and hops, I should say, and diagonal bounding. And we'll go through that. So you have a distance, you, okay. If you're not sure what a bound is, I, I urge you to look that up. Uh, or if you have someone that works in the fitness industry or the coaching industry or strength and conditioning coaching, 
to teach you because it is a is a very um, it can be a very complex exercise if you don't do it correctly uh, and obviously we, we talk about safety so we don't want anyone getting injured there and the last part the nutritional and the body composition take it from me having been home for a while it's very easy to open that fridge quite a few times as you walk past as you normally wouldn't during the day when you're at work or at school so uh, eating the right sort of mix of protein and carbs and fiber and good fats and trying to minimize saturated fats and sugars and salt in your diet will definitely help you as well okay so we're moving down now all right so this is an example of what we've just gone through i'm just moving pictures across there okay so how do you formulate it how do you put it all together how does it all work all right let's have a look at day by day here we've got monday we're working on some power in the lower body. We're working on some landing technique with double legs. We're gonna work with some speed, linear and lateral. We'll finish on some lower body strength. Now, I've got in there in green skill. We'll get to that in a second. I've also got flexibility, mobility, and you'll see everyday nutrition. Every, every single day. Cheap meals, yeah, they're okay, but I kind of think, if you're on it for a while, you've got to really be uh, diligent and motivated and disciplined. And then once you achieve your, your goals with, uh, with the uh, body composition side of things, okay, throw in a cheat meal, no problem. It's very important, guys and girls, when you, do your when you, when you set up your program, that the explosive movements and the, the, the high loading movements like landing and speed work and, and power work is done initially before your strength work. This is because the nervous system will be uh, fresh, it will be ready to go, um, and you'll be able to uh, get quality work done before the strength work, which typically, depending on your goals, might exhaust that muscular system more so, okay? We move to Tuesday, we go to some agility work. So there's a bit of uh, a difference there to start off the session. We marry that up with some change of direction work. Okay, so lateral and diagonal and multi-directional. They work well together because basically they're very similar movements. We do some upper body strength work and then we finish with some conditioning work. All right. So Monday and Tuesday are really good solid days if you get done right. Wednesday's a day off physically, but still you should work on your flexibility and mobility, keep your nutrition well. And I've just got down there, you'll see on Wednesday and Sunday on the two days off, I've got some active learning. What I mean by that, um, the best way to describe it, do something that you're interested in and try and learn something new. I mean, we have so much time, uh, typically with, with the, the way that, that COVID's gone, we've been a lot at all this time, try and gain some knowledge in an area that interests you, try and learn something new. It might be within hoops itself, sit down and watch a video and try and analyze what the players are doing and, and really try and uh, exercise your brain as much as you are your body, okay? We move through to Thursday. Now, Thursday is very similar to Monday. We've got a little bit of a difference in that we've got some upper and lower body power work. We've got some deceleration work uh, in a forward and diagonal plane, and we've got some strength in the lower body as well. Now, once again, the deceleration work and the landing work are different categories, but there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of overlap in how the muscles work. So we're typically working in a similar way. We're just focusing on different areas. Again, you've got your uh, skill, flexibility, mobility, and nutrition on that day. And then you move through Friday, we've got some multi-directional agility work, some change of direction work now where we're working some different movement patterns. Um, and we want, that actually should say strength first and then conditioning, that's an error on my part. So that strength work will go first and I'll fix that up um, so that if anyone's interested, and I should have said, if anyone's interested in getting a copy of this, um, more than happy to share it with everyone, but that should be strength work first, and then I believe conditioning after that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that is, that's how I wanted to put it. So my apologies there. 
um, finishing with the same at the end. And then I thought I'd throw in on Saturday, look, some active recovery. We might not be able to get through to, uh, to be able to uh, get a swim and access to a pool. Or you might go down to a beach and, you know, if, if the weather's good. I know it's pretty cold in Melbourne now, so that might not be an option either. But if you've got a bike, you hop on the bike and, uh, and just generally try and have some fun. Enjoy what you're doing. And then obviously Sunday's a day off. Okay. Moving through. All right. Here's where the magic happens. Hopefully. Let's move this out of the way. All right. So a lot of information there. A lot of information. Let's just take it slow. All right. The first day on the Monday, all of these exercises are in the first category that we listed. So if you're not sure, you can go back to that page once you get a copy of this and you can have a look. I've just tried to select some exercises that cover the areas that we're focusing on. Um, obviously, you can select any of those or some others that you might know of. Um, and then that way you can work through those different categories. But this is what it looks like once we've set our plan. We, we do some skipping for three minutes. You don't need a skipping rope. You can just do the action. That's all, you know, like I said, you don't need equipment. You can do the action, which will work through uh, quite a few joints in your body. You do some bounding work over 20 meters with a proper recovery. You do some box jumps for sets of five, three to five. You move through, you have the right recovery. You do some landing work there. And again, you guys can see this as much as I can, so you can read all through it. You progress from there into your speed work. By this time, your, your body's really working well. You should be primed. You should, your energy system should be at the best and you can really push yourself. And I should have said at the top of it, I did not put any warm up uh, type exercises in there. Uh, two reasons. Number one, everyone has individual requirements to warm up. I know some of the athletes that I've worked with, some guys you know, are ready in a few minutes. Some guys need a bit longer. Um, and the same goes across the board. If we, if we took 100 people in the room, I'm sure everyone would like to warm up differently for what they need. In my experience, as long as you get a mix of mobility, something that increases the heart rate, uh, and the movement patterns that you're going to do in the exercise program that follows, that constitutes a good warm-up. So with that, uh, I didn't put the warm-ups in because of that reason, but that's not to say they're not important. They're very important. And the other reason was I couldn't fit it on the page. So to be honest, I didn't want to uh, squeeze it sort of in and, and make it small so you couldn't read it. And I thought I'd mention that. But if anyone does need any specific type warm-up drills, more than happy to, uh, to put that out and, and share it with, with everyone that's on, on the uh, webinar tonight. So we move from speed. We're into our strength work. As you can see there, we're doing some leg work, some individual leg work. The pistol squat to me is one of the hardest squats there is. If you can get your butt to the ground on, on a pistol squat, you're doing pretty well. Um, your body weight squats, your hip lifts, your calf raises, and some core work at the end. Guys and girls, the sets and reps are all there. Making sure that you do each exercise with pure um, strict form is, is the biggest thing I'm going to say because form overrides everything. If you think of a free throw, if you just jab at the free throw, the ball's not going to go in. You've got to have that good follow through, got to extend your elbow nice and vertical to give that ball a chance to go in. So it's the same with your body. If you are working with sloppy form, the only thing you're gonna do is injure yourself and you're not gonna get stronger. So I can't emphasize that enough. All right, so that's day one. When we move to day two, which is Tuesday, we then have some agility work, some T drills and star drills, change of direction with, which builds in nicely from that, um, some bounding and some hop work there. And then we're doing some upper body work, some push-ups some overhand grip body rows now if you can get to a park and, and some of these parks have these calisthenic type uh, equipment there and you can use for rowing uh, for, for push-ups and rows and pull-ups and chin-ups and all those sorts of things um, you can definitely use that if you can't all you need to do is grab a towel hopefully grab someone that's in your family uh, mum dad brother sister whoever have, you know, get them to hold a towel and you hold the other end of the towel. 
And all you're doing is the same action. You're rowing. So you're getting all that posterior chain in your upper body working. Um, exact same movement pattern. And the resistance is the person holding the towel with, uh, with you there and then. And they can make it harder or easier depending on your strength levels. So that's a very important one. Whenever you, whenever you work, um, the front part of your body always got to work the back part. You can't sort of just leave one and, and, and negate one so that your, your strengths are becoming stronger and your weaknesses are becoming weaker. The pipe push-up's an interesting one. You're basically doing a push-up in a V position. Uh, so you're working those shoulders pretty well. Tough one to do, looks very easy, but works the core as well as the upper body and shoulders. The, uh, the wood chops with a basketball, exactly as it sounds, you're just chopping a movement across your body. And again, you can look that up or you can let me know and I can definitely send you some, uh, some pictures and some links and then some core work at the end. Okay, so that's your strength work at, uh, at, uh, on that day. When you look at the conditioning work, now we're really cooking the, uh, the engine. 20 meter shuttles, one to two blocks of 10 reps by 20 meters. Five seconds with an 18 second work rest recovery. So picture this, you've got a 20 meter distance. You run 20 meters in five seconds. You have 18 seconds rest while you're standing at the finish line. You finish that 18 seconds rest. You run 20 meters back in five seconds. You have 18 seconds rest. You keep going. One, two, three, four, five, and so on, all the way up to 10. That is your block of 10 reps of 20 meters with those times and those recoveries. Okay? As you get better, it might not seem like a lot. You might start with one block. As you get better, you move it to two, maybe going even further. Three, you could be an advanced athlete. You can definitely, and you will find that this will really work that uh, anaerobic energy system very well. Okay? Moving through to Wednesday. All right, there's some, some names here that maybe people out there aren't familiar with. Definitely let me know. Uh, but again, if you, if you Google this, you'll, you'll definitely find them on, on, uh, online. I've started off, even though it's a day off, I spoke about still working your body to some degree in that uh, we're looking at how the body recovers here. Some Spider-Man work in, is basically hip mobility work. Some hamstring sort of type squatting is, is a lot of mobility through the hamstrings and the hips. Some bird dogs are, are working on the muscles on the hips, which is the glutes at the back. Some sumo squats on the groins. Some rotation through your mid spine. Some lower back work through your, your scorpions. And your single leg lunge hold to, to work the mobility through the ankle. Now, very important that you know exactly what you're doing before you try any of those. So once again, I emphasize that you look them up and read them up or speak to someone that's a professional working in, in the system or just shoot an email to myself. And then you finish with the stretch uh, and you're covering all those areas that I've listed there that you're stretching. Now, again, flexibility is important, but we're not aiming for uh, ballerina or, or gymnast type flexibility. If you're a basketball athlete, your flexibility, flexibility sh should be optimal for whatever the actions and the movements that you're performing. So that means if you can get your hamstring while you're lying on your, on, your, uh, on your back and you get your leg with a straight leg to 90 degrees and that's where you are, well, that's where you are and you work on that flexibility. doesn't mean you have to get it all the way back. It's what's optimal for you to perform the actions that you, that you need to do, okay? Now we move through to Thursday. Okay, and basically, like I said, Thursday is a bit of a mirror image of Monday. So we're getting two similar hits, although I've mixed that in with different exercises. So you can see in the power, we've got pogos, we've got split jumps, we've got the two uh, areas being worked in the upper and lower body on, on the Thursday. So you've got some power push-ups and you've got some uh, basketball scoop tosses. So you're basically in a squat position, you're holding the ball with an underhand, you're throwing that thing as far as it can go, as long as it doesn't go over the backyard or over someone else's fence or breaks a window, then we're happy days. Um, you move through to some landing work, but now I've put some single leg work in there. Uh, and then that builds you in through to your strength work, which you can see 
There's some variation now from Monday session where you're really working on those muscles of the groin, of the hamstrings, of the glutes, and some posterior chain work and even the calf work there. And then finishing off with a bit of core work with some plank holes. So similar day to Monday, varying it a little bit with where you're targeting and then making sure that you uh, are still working at a certain intensity that you're improving. That works through till Friday with our last day of the week on some agility work with the start. Uh, again, like I said, you can think of any drill that you want that's specific to your position, but I've just put in there figure eights. And what I mean by four by one is basically you're doing a drill, that's, once, that's one rep, you're doing four sets. So you can do the drill, you know, starting and running right in a figure eight and then starting and running left. So you can do two each side. And a cross drill, if you think of a cross, you're starting in the middle, right? You're running forward, then you're running back, then you're running back to the middle, then you're running left, then you're running right. So we're getting some uh, variations in, in direction definitely there, okay? And agility as well. Um, when you move into change of direction, we talked about the sprint and stop with alternating leg, and now we're doing some slide and stop as well, okay? That builds into your strength work which is upper body. Um, what I've got there is a wide grip, WG's wide grip push-ups. And again, there's probably about 50 or so variations of push-ups. As you progress through your strength levels, you can definitely mix that up. Um, I've put their, put their body rows, I've put UHG, underhand grip. So if you can see that, that's that way. OHG is overhand grip. Differences in muscle, muscles used and musculature working through that upper back and, and uh, posterior chain. And again, you don't have access to, to some of those parks or calisthenics parks, grab a towel, get someone to help you out. Definitely works. Your diamond push-ups, that's the position of your hands. Place them there on the ground. Give that a go. That'll definitely work that upper body much harder than a normal push-up. Some wood chops and some seated rotations to finish. The strength component, when you move through to the conditioning, you will see that as with Tuesday's session, we are working similarly, but we're now working 40 meters. Okay, now you might say to me, listen, Pop, you know, court's only 28 meters. Sure. Okay, so the 20 meter one works really well. But I've always been a firm believer that you got to try and extend yourself a little bit more um, 40 meters is obviously longer than the basketball court, but it gives your body the ability to work at a little bit of a longer distance and get those muscles used to more than it actually has to do. So then when you get to the 20 meter sprint, hey, it's a lot easier. Okay. So that covers the whole week. I'm sure there will be some questions about that. Um, I put Saturday down like I put there, cycling, walking, have fun, and then Sunday's your day off. Okay, now before we before I sort of finish and bring this to an end, we'll slide that down. Creativity, you'll see some pictures there. Okay, myself and a coach I used to work with. These are my take home messages take your time, gradual progression, safety first. Definitely make sure you're safe, don't do anything that you can't do or, or you're, you're thinking, well, you know, I'm gonna make sure I can do this, you know, because it's on the program. No, scale it back if it's, if it's too hard. For example, if the diamond push-up's too hard, scale it back to a normal push-up. But within that, make sure you challenge yourself and you get better every day. To me, training and, and being involved in sports and exercise should be fun. And I've put down there, have fun. If you're not having fun when you're doing what you're doing, What's the use there? What's the purpose? You've got to make sure you enjoy it. Otherwise, it becomes very much of a, of a grind and laborious and it becomes something that you don't want to do. So you've got to find some fun and you've got to put some, some, uh, some fun into it. And what I thought I'd do is to finish everything off, we'll share a video with you. So if I can get you, Justin, to, to stop that for the moment. Absolutely, Matt. I don't want to see that shameless plug anymore of yourself. <laughs> Um, I am probably going to put myself in a uh, bit of a, a, a twist here, but uh, it is what it is. When I say have fun, you got to make sure 
you have some fun. And this is, as you can see, it's me hanging off the, the, the pull-up bar there. This pull-up bar I actually purchased and, and I put it in the uh, apartment I was living in overseas when I was working overseas. You can see the stairs going up, up to the bedroom there. And I don't know, I just, a bit of a crazy guy sometimes. So I just thought I'd have some fun and uh, I'll play you the video and you can sort of say the rest. So anyway, showing off, no, no showing off there, no showing off. Just wanted to sort of share that with everyone. I always try and put some fun in it because I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we get one chance at doing what we love doing. And uh, you, if, if you're not enjoying it, you know, what's the use? So as you can see, I kind of throw things in to, to keep it lighthearted. And that was my wife laughing there and uh, giving me a heap. So. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, like I said, if there's any questions, please you know, fire away, send, send emails to the club or myself and uh, happy to sort of help we, with anything there. We, we have a few for you right now, Pop. Uh, and sure. Great job as thorough as ever, as thorough as your bathroom routine in the morning, I reckon. Um, <laughs> first one we've got here for you. Uh, when basketball returns, this coach wants to know what's the best way to get there players back into practice without risking injury straight away what are your recommendations there so if, if someone's following something like what we just uh, explained and went through you're exposing the body to certain loads that you would expose on the court so um hopefully you've had your players work through that and then they're ready for a practice but i would definitely err on the side of caution i'd start with some drill work i'd start with things that are in the half court and progress as you would any program progress it up with your practices from an individual half court sort of based model to then extending that out to a full court scrimmage type model and and that doesn't have to necessarily be within the one session um, you can work that over a number of sessions so you might sort of say to yourself look if I've got three weeks or so before the competitive games start, okay, we've got two practices a week. The first two are going to be half court based and making sure that all the players and the athletes there are warmed up, ready to go. Then they've been doing work while they've been away from the court. And now we've got four more sessions to build up that, uh, that full court component. Beautiful. Uh, warm up and cool down. Uh, both, training and after a game. A lot of uh, VJBL kids and domestic kids were just playing, jump straight back into the car. Um, first off, your opinions on how important it is uh, for athlete development uh, and just some, some maybe quick uh, tips on how to make sure that gets done. Big, big time on warm-ups. Got to make sure that you're ready to do something. You can't just jump on the court and sprint 100 miles an hour up and down the court. So mobility, movement patterns, increasing your heart rate, whether it's a light jog, whether it's some, some movement patterns where you're, you're increasing range of motion through your hips, through your hamstrings, through your calves, some shoulder rotation of work type, you know, some passing, some dribbling, some, some skill work to get yourself warmed up. Uh, I'm a big believer of uh, cool downs in terms of that's where you can work on your flexibility. Um, stretching, static stretching is something that you need to do at the end of a session because although there's arguments for and against static stretching before, uh, before activity, most of the research I've read has shown that static stretching decreases power output. So the mobilization of joints and, and the increased temperature of mus muscles is what helps us perform better at a, at a powerful rate or a quicker rate. Um, and your static stretching should be done for about five to 10 minutes, maybe 15 if you need it for certain areas after practice. Is that a blanket approach for every athlete or are, all, are some athletes different on that? Yeah, approach? good question. I mean, look, it's always, I treat every athlete I've worked with individually. You've got to look at what, some, some guys and girls will sit there and say, no, if I don't stretch my, my lower back before I start, um, I'm going to have issues. So no problem at all. You've got to work with the people that, that know their bodies better than I would or, or any other coach. They know what they need. So if they're happy, they need that, that certain uh, specific uh, component before a, before a practice, like a static stretch, by all means, throw it in there. 
There's no harm. Beautiful. Uh, Carl's asked here, I think this is about our season, how much of the training session is taken up with your conditioning work in regards to our weekly practices? And does that change throughout the season? Do you want to well, talk about what, the way we go about it? Yeah, well, hopefully once I talk to coach, maybe I can get a little bit more time this, this coming season. So <laughs> we'll see how we go. But uh, look, there's always a component. Um, all jokes aside, both Dean and Justin and Ross last year all sort of allowed me to have as much time as I needed to get the guys working. And we, we did build a speed component into our warm-up. So there was definitely a lot more time there um, to do that. I, I believe, you know, you've got you to prep the athletes for as much as time as you can before a season. When the season comes around, depending on, the, on how many games you're playing, then it changes. You're not going to be able to do as much work, especially if the games are closer together. So for me, you know, um, having that element beforehand, afterhand is crucial to, to the way the team gets ready for practice and then recovers from it. And the weight room, Pop, how many times a week are the boys in the weight room with you? Uh, Pre-season and post and during season. Okay, so like like Dean mentioned before, um, currently the guys are on at three sessions a week. As we go into official pre-season, because we're into off-season now, we're looking at ramping that up to four and maybe even five for some guys. You know, we, we had a lot of guys last year do extra sessions if they didn't play enough or they didn't get to, to practice uh, for whatever reason, whether it be injuries or, or illnesses or, or whatnot. So... We're trying to individualise that as much as, as we can. And again, when it gets to in-season, it all depends on the games. But typically, we try and get at least two sessions in a week. And sometimes these guys will come in to do some specific rehab works. So it might be half a session on a third day. But uh, that's, that's typically how we look at it. Maybe four to five in the pre. And then we're looking at uh, two, possibly three in-season, depending. And it, come, it can come down to one session as well if you're playing two, three games in a week. Could be our world this season, potentially. Um, <laughs> just some clarity on some of the stuff you had there, Pop. A question here, 40 minute shuttles in the same time constraints as the 20 meter, i.e. the five seconds, 18 second rest. Is no, that, no, no, on that, there, I think I had seven and 25 for the 40. Should be and, that, okay. Yeah, I did have that. And the recovery is long, yeah, the recovery is longer because obviously you're run, running a 20 meter extra distance. So you're not gonna, you get 40 metres in five seconds, sign you up. You're pretty quick. Beautiful. Uh, from Con here, mate, like, what are the most important components of training, in your opinion? So if, uh, if they've got a short period of time to work with it, um, you know, strength, power, what would you invest most time in? Um, especially if it's like a 30 to 60 minute maximum sort of training week. Yeah, good question. Uh, Look, you, I always say you've got to look at the, the individual first and where their weaknesses are. That's the most important thing. So if you're a, a pretty quick person, but you haven't got a lot of strength to you and you get pushed around, well, maybe you focus on the strength. If you're quite strong, but you're not that quick, well, you're going to work on, on, on the speed and power explosive type movements. But at the same time, um, you just got to make sure that um, you look at the game. The game isn't, a, you know, especially internationally and, and here in Australia, it's a quite a quick game. You know, athletes are getting up and down that court quick. So if I had to pick my poison, so to speak, explosive, quick athletes. Does that change for the age group? We'll have some under 12 coaches here, or is that the same whether it's 12s, 14s, 16s, 18s? 100%. Good question, Justin. 100%. At that age of maturation, you've got to make sure that the joints are strong and stable. And with, with younger athletes, their growth plates are still having closed. They're still growing. So loading the spine is, is, is something that you've got to be very, very careful of. Um, obviously, no external load on the spine for someone that's 12 years old. But when you're going through that maturation process, learning your body, how to move well, just basic movements, you know, pushing, pulling, squatting, lunging, those type of movements that, that help knees and ankles and spines develop. Um, but also, you know, the... Young kids can do some some certain type of plyometric movements, but I definitely wouldn't um, overload that area because of the uh, the tendency to you know have soft tissue injuries and those type of things. But you've got to gradually progress it because plyometric exercise will increase, and it's shown to increase bone density. So that's something that that young kids are obviously developing. 
So this goes into Damien's question a little bit here. He's asking, would you modify it for under 14s, but also talking about female athletes. Is there any difference between male and female athletes in, in that age group? 100%, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Just one that comes off the top of my, my head is because female athletes have different dimensions through their hips for obvious reasons as, the, as a younger girl matures and the body progresses, for, for into womanhood for childbirth you have wider hips and then you have a different angle coming towards the knee that knee that angle is called the q angle so a female athlete is pro, uh, not always but most of the time predisposed to more knee injuries because of the angle that the way the knee comes into um, so i definitely modify it when you're having a look at a female athlete squatting do, they, do their knees come in? Do they knock knees? Are they able to, to keep a parallel between those knees and really work their hips more so so they're not sort of going in and collapsing under load? And you'll find landing is a, is, is a big one for that. So if you watch uh, female athletes at a younger age land or any, any age land, you'll see those knees collapse and getting a lot of stress through those ligaments and tendons that obviously can lead to injury. So can... Can they land with a good stable position of the knee? Beautiful. Uh, just a question around the th three minute run. What's the minimum up backs we should be expecting? Do you rem remember this was an old boomers test for a long time? Yeah. I think I'm pretty sure I saw Patty get to 30 or 31. Yeah. Uh, what I, what would you sure. say is a minimum? Uh, look, if you're getting in, in the low 20s as a minimum, 21, 22, you're getting, it's not flying, but. Uh, I think Joey was there. Joey Ingalls was there, and he think he did 28 or 29 yeah, one day. I think that was his benchmark. Yeah, that was his. So, and again, Paddy, Paddy Mills at a guard, you know, flying through at 30, you'd expect that. He's, he's a different position for Joe. He's a bit bigger. Um, he got 28 or 29. So I'd say if you're a younger athlete, you can get 20, 21, 22. You're doing really well. And then as you mature and you get older, if some of the older athletes and a little bit more developed, you start to get to that 25, 26 mark. That's what you're looking at. I'll just throw into that. We've done that. Standard. I was the minimum standard in New Zealand at 22. So <laughs> we couldn't beat the coach, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point, Dino. you got to make sure you beat the coach. <laughs> the other one I'd add to that is we've used that with uh, the Crocs program for a long time. And it's just been about beat your, your previous by at least half a length. Like just exactly. keep trying to improve it by half a length. Um, whatever their base level is, keep pushing through with that. Um, exactly. exactly. Question from Al, good to see you online, Al. Uh, working with a young female athlete, um, only has access, sorry, uh, outside concrete court, anything that he should be doing to steer her away from out of the, the exercises? I wouldn't land on concrete. It's pretty tough. It's pretty tough, you know, doing your landing drills, Look, um, as long as you've got some good shoes there and making sure that, uh, that that's stable, um, the high impact type exercise, the jumping, the bounding, the landing is, is stuff that you've got to be careful with concrete, especially like we we're just talking about with female athletes or, or male at a younger age. You've got to be really careful there. So all the high impact stuff is, is something that you should try to do somewhere else if you can. Hello. I've got to apologise, Al. My eyes are watering because the missus is cooking French onion soup and it's getting to me. Um, <laughs> last one here from Con. Uh, just asking about how much we train landing with our athletes. I know that's something huge with the Centre of Excellence. Um, what's your opinions on that one, Pop? Sorry, what was the question? I just missed it. How much we're training landing with athletes? A specific landing? Yeah, just actual <laughs> landing technique. And it goes on to ask, you know, do you just stick to technique uh, training or do you try and make it more random and simulate the game? Look, last year we used it with everyone. We used it with all of our guys at particular times. And then once you've got the landing um, at a point where everything's working well and technically, can you jump out of it? Can you land and jump out of it? One leg, two legs. So there's a progression there that, that works in with each, each player's program. But... That's something that I'm, and I know Steve, our physio and our medical team there are big on because, like I said, you know, a lot of injuries happen through landing. And so we try and bring it into our program for everyone at some point, definitely. Beautiful. 
Uh, mate, that's all the questions that have come through to now. We might start wrapping that up. Thank you very much for that very thorough presentation. Uh, as Thanks. we said, guys, if anyone wants it, we'll, uh, Kylie from, we'll make sure that gets out to us, uh, to everyone that's been on the call. Uh, Dino, I'll throw to you, mate. Anything to, to wrap up on that or any other thoughts that Pop hasn't covered? Yeah, I thought it was interesting that you started with the, the squats with people on their shoulders as the, that first exercise. Initially seeing that one, it took me back to when Russia came to Australia and played the Boomers in a series. Um, and I remember going to it at the glass house, I think it was, but watching them train at Albert Park and seeing Marshallinas just grab one of the centres, put him on his shoulders, grab onto one of the poles at the end of court one there and squat him 10 times. I'm like, wow, I've just never seen anything like this before. And yeah. uh, you know, to see people still finding a way to get their squats in is, is quite incredible. Yeah, I, I found, Dean, that uh, other cultures, uh, I've looked at some, some really high-level, intense Russian programs and they do a lot of their plyometrics in barefoot, no shoes, because they believe the building of the tendons in the feet you know, minimizes if you have shoes on. So obviously, you know, that clip was from China and you have different culture and different beliefs in that. But but the guys were pretty good. And, and you know, the big thing with that is safety. You've got to have a strong, stable base to be able to do that. But like you said, you know, some of those guys are pretty big guys and you put them on their backs, it's, it's pretty tough to do. But uh, I thought I'd throw that out there just to start with something different, yeah. No, great job, Pop. Um, you Thank know, you. Love seeing the, the fun parts of it as well. And again, it's something that we're... I remember watching Damien Martin's retirement speech the other night and Matty Nielsen sent him a message about three things in his retirement. Uh, did you have a red-hot crack? Did you have fun? And did you win? And uh, three pretty good things to, to look at every practice. And, you know, did you get those things done? So um, same thing with in the gym. Having fun would be a good component of it. Absolutely. You've got to enjoy it, like I said. And uh, I appreciate it, guys. And thank you. And hopefully everyone out there, you know, got something from it. And, uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to seeing everyone again at some point. Before we wrap up, Pop, how many NBL championships do you have? Uh, four. Make it five this year. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for everyone jumping online. It's been good to get back into this. We've definitely missed it, uh, albeit under not the circumstances we'd like to do it. The club's putting some stuff together uh, moving ahead. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we definitely want to thank our sponsors again, mainly Dream Street Lending for, for supporting us as coaches, but Tire Power, SodaStream, Buller, Trojan Tools, Rolled, Harcourts, Subaru, TAC, Moose Toys, Chemist Warehouse, Wiz and Sporting Globe. Uh, we really appreciate their support through this and, Hope everyone stays safe and well, and uh, we'll see you guys online again soon.